is a distinguished professor over at UC Davis. Um, he's also um, a past director of UC Center Sacramento and still sits on our advisory board. And so we are thrilled that he could be here today to introduce our speaker, uh, Dean Gary Segura from UCLA. Thank you. Um, my name is Mark Huckbell. Um, I'm a faculty member in political science at UC Davis. Um, and uh, Rich Travis couldn't be here today, and he asked me to step in. And I was happy to do that because I know the speaker, and I've known him for a long time. In addition to being dean of the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA, Gary Segura has served on faculties at Stanford, the University of Washington, University of Iowa, Claremont Graduate School, and our own UC Davis. It goes without saying that he is a leading scholar in American politics. He's been cited thousands of times. He's the author of numerous books and scholarly articles. He's been principal investigator on nationwide um, survey election studies. Um, his work addresses a range of topics, including uh, studies of war casualties and their localized consequences for domestic politics, race and, and um, ethnic politics in the United States, the consequences of divided government, the political implications of environmentalism, the effects of minority-majority districts on turnout, and much more. His work has been particularly relevant and accessible for students of California politics. Um, I've regularly assigned his article on earthquakes and aftershocks, um, which is a probing account of the ways in which Prop 187 and other contentious ballot propositions have alienated major groups in California politics, as well as altering party politics and levels of partisan competition. It's a pleasure to have Dean Segura here, and I'm sure you all want to welcome him with a round of applause. I have, in fact, known Bob a very long time. Um, and as an element of discretion, I won't try to recount the year. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you for coming here uh, and for hearing what I have to say. Um, and um, I'm going to talk today about uh, some work that is ideally going to be a book and that we're aiming to make a book. Um, and uh, we're in the, we just completed a new round of data collection, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but essentially, we're asking some pretty well-explored um, uh, well questions and want to do it from some new perspectives regarding the behavior of the American electorate. So I'm going to begin with two fairly obvious and by now relatively well-examined questions in political science. And one is, one that political scientists ask a lot is, a fair number people with modest incomes consistently vote for the economic con economically conservative party. Why? I love this question for two reasons. One is, it's one I ask myself all the time. So you see these you know, working class voters marching off to the polls to cast their ballot against the estate tax, which they will never themselves be subjected to. Um, but it's also a really interesting revelation of the, the socioeconomic class bias in political science. Because we always look at poor people doing things we don't expect them to do and think there's something wrong with that. But in fact, there is an equally vexing question at the other end of the economic distribution. What is a fair number of people with higher incomes voting for the economically redistributive party? And why is that? So we're going to ask both of those questions, and we're going to try to tear apart uh, essentially the nearly infinite ways that people can go wrong in mapping their social circumstances and their economic circumstances to their vote choice. And part of the book project is trying to figure out which of those is actually accounting for most of the variation. So the question, why is the electorate divorced from class? To what is this so? Uh, is this pattern consistent throughout subpopulations of citizens? And importantly, and what I'm going to talk about mostly today, is there a modal path to class inconsistent political behavior, or are there multiple processes? So to the extent that we think of people um, voting their social class and perhaps getting it wrong, do they get it wrong the same way, or do they get it wrong through different processes? And that's what we're going to focus on. 
So a lot of spilled ink on this. This is something that political scientists have been arguing about for about 15 years now. Arguing about it forever. My old boss, Mike Lewis, is an economics and elections guy, and, and his work goes back three decades. Um, but Thomas Frank's uh, work, What's the Matter with Kansas? And in this, he makes the argument that cultural issues displace economic ones, and that a new conservative populism has redefined class politics. So it's no longer high income and low income. It's beer drinkers and wine drinkers. And beer drinkers vote one way, and wine drinkers vote another way. Bartel's response to this, which was we call what's the matter with Thomas Frank, but he actually wrote an article called What's the Matter with What's the Matter with Kansas. He makes the claim that there's little evidence in the change of the behavior of the working class, that the working class is not conservative. Are they looking at the same data? I'll show you. They may or may not be. And finally, Andy Gelman uh, did a macro analysis at the aggregate level to show that, and this kind of hints at the second question I asked about high income voters, that it is the highest income states that are most consistently blue. And says that this also suggests that there's a little bit of a mystery going on. And that within states, the link between income and political behavior remains strong. The puzzle. The puzzle is that the volume of class inconsistent political behavior is still large. Whether or not it has increased, and we can argue with Bartels about that, um, and perhaps the slope on income is non-zero, but it is still the case. In 2004, for example, 36% of people living at or below the poverty line were voting Republican, while 38% were voting Democrat. I can go year by year and show you that this is pretty commonly the case. So it's less about whether individuals deviate from economic voting and more about why those deviations occur. So the response that we start working on in this book is to build a comprehensive model of economic voting and identify where and under what circumstances the deviations take place and examine whether deviations occur at different points for different groups. So now I'm going to slip into my professorial mode and start with a very simple model of economic voting. So this is the model of economic voting that we sort of believe in a civics book sense. And in fact, all of Western democracy um, was in, in large measure organized on the notion that there would be a right of center party and a left of center party. They differed on the role of government. They differed on the degree to which uh, goodies were redistributed across the society. And so uh, economic status, one looks at one's economic status, you see what's in your interests, you adopt a set of policy positions to support those interests, and you cast your vote. Well, that is simple, and it's so simple, it's, so, it's clearly consistently wrong. So we want to look a little bit more at sort of beginnings of how this can go wrong. So for starters, there's a difference between your objective economic status and your subjective economic status. If you look at data from the American National Election Study, and even through 2016, you will find that people whose household income are about $60,000 a year are as likely as people whose household incomes are about $260,000 a year to claim that they are, in fact, middle class. That is not possibly so. Like, even in Los Angeles or the Bay Area, if you have $260,000, your life is profoundly different than if you have $60,000, right? So we have this uh, uh, uncanny ability in US history to misperceive our own economic circumstances. I mentioned at the start that we're, we're gathering a new data set on this. The data that we're using in the analysis today are from 2011. The data set that we gathered in 2018 repeats some of these analyses. But we also have this really interesting question. We use a slider and we ask the respondents, what share of the American public have in household income lower than yours? I haven't seen this yet, but I can't wait. Because people are going to systematically underestimate, high income people are going to systematically underestimate how wealthy they are. Um, if, if I hear one more person driving a BMW tell me that they're middle class, I swear I'm gonna, my head's going to explode. The second intervention is the difference between policy positions and vote choice and the intervention of partisan identification. So people like Bob Huckfeld and I have been watching this over the last couple of years, particularly as it's played out during the Trump administration. And you find people saying and articulating beliefs in absolutely crazy things. 
And the only thing that accounts for that is their partisan identification. So there's a whole line of research in the political psychology literature called motivated reasoning. And in, in the various Twitter uh, profiles I like to follow and, and laugh at, uh, the, the argument goes that partisan identification is a hell of a drug. That if you believe, you see yourself to be a Democrat, a Democrat could say any wackadoodle thing and you're likely to agree with it, and vice versa on the Republican side. I'll hold my tongue as to who's saying the most wackadoodle. You can fill that in yourself. So there's lots of different deviations from economic voting. There could be conceptual errors that result from the misunderstanding of the world, and there could be linkage errors that are a failure to correctly connect the steps. And so taking that original diagram, we can problematize that a little bit with not knowing your own economic status, judging where that is subjective to all others so you don't have a class um, uh, location for yourself. That means you might misjudge what's in your interest. You might not actually understand the policy. There's certainly low information voters who don't know much about the policies that we're proposing. You may not know which party favors which position. You may misunderstand the parties and be motivated to adopt irrational positions based on effective identification with parties. You may misjudge the candidates' positions, and ultimately, you may cast an incorrect vote. See, there's dozens of ways to get it wrong. So to kind of begin exploring this, we um, used a great uh, data set that we crafted as part of the pilot studies for the 2012 National Election Study. One of the, the studies done in 2011 focused primarily on class politics and on economic policy. But let's start where political scientists used to always start, and that is ideology. <laughs> so um, looking at people whose income is below the median and people whose income is above the median, you'll see uh, an ideological distribution that, with a couple of bumps, more or less looks normal, with a single peak in the center, and basically saying that you know some people think of themselves as liberal, some people think of themselves as conservative, and a lot of people call themselves moderate. Now, that's a terrible measure for a hundred different reasons. Um, we know that self-reported ideology is a bad proxy for policy preferences. I can remember one of the first papers I wrote back in 1988 during the 88 presidential election, which I recognize is a decade or more before most of you were born. Um, it was, it, this was a, at the peak period of time where there was a negative effect of loading the word liberal. So much so that I remember undergraduates in the class I was TAing wearing a scarlet L, because liberal was like the scarlet letter, right? Um, and at that time, you could find in the electorate in 1988, you could find respondents who would tell you that they were pro-choice, pro-environment, pro-progressive taxation, they wanted the estate tax to go up, not down, and they would describe themselves as moderately conservative. And every political scientist's head would just explode with such a thing. So ideology is a bad way of understanding what people think. So we actually asked a set of questions about their specific economic policy preferences, and we asked each question twice. We pose the policy and say, would this be good, bad, or neither good nor bad for you personally? And then we asked again, would this be good, bad, or neither good nor bad for the country? You won't be surprised to hear that many people think that what's good for them is good for the country. But it's not uniform. And I'll show you those distributions in just a minute. So I use the two distributions of policy preferences to identify respondents who get it wrong. That is, they get it wrong personally or ideologically, meaning that they identify policy positions that are inconsistent with their economic place in the distribution. And this will allow us to distinguish false consciousness, the idea that people don't understand their own interests, from actively making decisions uh, contrary to their own interests. So the six economic policies we measured on were to end the current Medicare system and replace it with a system of credits, raise the minimum wage every year to keep pace with inflation, increase taxes on people making over $250,000 a year, increase taxes on corporations, replace Social Security with private retirement accounts, and reduce US federal government spending on everything the government spends money on. Now, you'll notice that three of those issues are valenced in the progressive direction, 
and three of those are a valence in the conservative direction so that we have uh, some balance in the scale. We create two measures, kind of where your six positions add up for what you think is in your interest, and where your six positions add up for what you think is in the interest of the country. They're a little noisy, but this is what we come up with. So the first thing is that the policies that are good for you and the policies that are good for the country correlate at 0.75. Okay, that's not surprising. People tend to think they hold right positions, and what's good for them is good for America, et cetera, and so forth. Um, also not surprising, neither one of the scales is extremely highly correlated with ideology. I told you it was a bad measure. Okay. So what does the distribution look like? So this essentially divides the range into three segments. You can think of the middle of each range as moderate, meaning that their scores are somewhere in the middle of the distribution. And we were very generous. We always scored moderates as getting it right. So you got it right if you were a moderate or you held a liberal or conservative position consistent with your income status. So this is the distribution for all income, all respondents who are below the median income. So they are essentially a little bit to medium progressive, right? So the midpoint of the scale is the moderate position. And in general, working class people are somewhat progressive, somewhat liberal. And not many people are getting it wrong. There are not a lot of low-income people who are holding really conservative economic policy positions, either for themselves or for the country. So if we looked at the distribution just of voters who have below median income, we would find a huge percentage of those respondents are moderate to liberal both for their own interest and for the interest of the country. Relatively few people getting it wrong. What about for people who make above the median income? Somewhat interestingly, we're still slightly shifted to the left. Now, in terms of what's good for yourself, it tends to really peak there at the moderate position. But what's good for the country is actually also shifted somewhat to the progressive direction. Now, the number of people who are quote unquote getting it wrong are actually quite large. Not so bad for what's in your own interest, but way bad for what's in the interest of the society. Putting that into sort of English, what that means is that there's lots of people who make above median income who think that progressive redistributive economic policies are good for the country even if it's necessarily bad for them, which they may or may not agree. So looking at the same sort of graph, you'll see that there's lots of error for upper income people. Again, we treat moderation as a gimme, and not a lot of people in the upper income uh, categories holding consistently conservative positions. So when we summarize these, 91% of our lower, below median income respondents believe liberal to moderate policies are good for themselves and good for the country. 91%. Only 52.5% of above median income respondents believe conservative economic policies are good for them and good for the country. We didn't see that coming. If we limit this to just people who have high political interest, people who answered a set of questions to suggest that they pay attention to politics, the numbers vary a little. So there's a slight diminution in consistent progressivism among the working classes. But the situation over on the upper income folks gets even worse. Only about 41% of well-informed upper income people hold consistently conservative positions for themselves and the country. So self-reported ideology appears to demonstrate a centrist or slightly center-right population, but by contrast, views on actual economic policy are skewed meaningfully to the left. There's a significant variation between pocketbook and sociotropic evaluations of policy, especially for high-income persons. So what does this teach us? 
first thing it teaches us is that low-income respondents get it right more often than smart, smart aleck um, social scientists who think that the working classes just don't know what's good for them. In fact, lots and lots and lots of them got it right. By the way, we still have the puzzle that they're not all voting that way, and I'll come back to that. About a third of upper income folks deviate ideologically, favor really progressive economic policies, and some evidence of sociotropic evaluations because they are differentiating more than the working class between what's good for them and what's good for the country. But curiously, more of these deviators think that liberal policies are good for them too than we would have otherwise expected, implying either a misperception of their own economic class, these are the, the BMW driving middle class, or a more expansive utility function, and we're going to talk about that. It's worth noting, by the way, that I use the median income to divide the two groups, and you can divide it a couple of different ways. If I look at the, the third and fourth income quartiles, so the, the merely above the median versus the very well-to-do, they look alike. I would have thought that the more well-to-do would have been more consistently conservative. It is not the case. So controlling for higher levels of political interest increases the deviation among high-income folks. So what's causing this? So I'm going to rule out a couple of artifacts. One is race. So one of our concerns was that this 91% number on the previous slide was artific artificially inflated because a preponderance of African-American and Latino respondents are in the low-income category. And they're very consistently democratic and very consistently economically progressive. And we thought that that might be inflating the consistency, this 91%. If I take out racial and ethnic minorities, I don't get much difference. I'm still getting 89% of only white respondents um, below, in, below median income choosing economically progressive policies for themselves and the country. A second thought is the Southern problem. Um, every political behavior person deals with the Southern problem. So um, at the risk of being indelicate, apparently a history of owning human beings shapes your political behavior 150 years later or whatever. And it turns out that that continues to be true. Um, but the, the mechanisms for that are not clear. There's some form of um, ideological bases. There's social norms, et cetera. Um, and then there's old-fashioned racism. But when we look at Southerners versus non-Southerners, we're not seeing a lot of difference, right? So it's not the case that Southerners are our deviants and non-Southerners are more likely to hold class-consistent positions. Even in the South, white Southerners are going to articulate liberal policies for themselves and for the country. For upper income Southerners, we actually do see uh, about a nine point difference where upper income Southerners are more consistently conservative than their non Southern counterparts. But again, that's not such a wild difference as to explain everything that we see. So, what's left to explain? We have clear evidence of ideological deviation among higher Americans, we have much less evidence for lower income Americans, and this result holds even accounting for race in the South. So the next step is to see how deviance relates to votes. So does what you believe about the economy determine whether you vote Democratic or Republican when you walk into the polling place? There is no question that holding class inconsistent economic preferences predicts class inconsistent voting. But class consistent economic views are much less successful. Um, at, excuse me, class consistent economic views are less successful at telling us who R will vote for. So let's start first with below, below median income, low, working class folks. So for the 9%, remember 91% are in this first column. For the 9% who say, even though I'm working class, I want conservative positions for myself and the country, they vote Republican. Well, that makes sense. But for the 91% who say, I want uh, progressive policies for me and progressive policies for the country, still about 40% of them are voting Republican. 
So this, these bars are the same height because they're within groups, but in fact, this represents only 9% of these low-income people, and this represents 91%. How about on the upper income side? If an upper income person holds progressive policy positions for themselves in the country, they're going to vote Democrat. Again, very predictive. If an upper class person holds conservative policy positions, about 46% of them still vote Democrat as well. But we still have deviations that occur, in some instances, without regard to class deviation uh, on, on economic policy preferences, and sometimes more consistently. I think I'm going to go to the next slide to make it a little clearer. So imagine, so this is above median income voters. So 56% of them hold moderate to conservative views. 44% of them hold liberal views. If you held liberal views, you have an almost 90% chance of voting Democratic. If you hold conservative views, it's about 55-45. So for the wealthy, knowing that they're going against their own social placement in terms of their economic preferences has a huge predictive effect on their vote. Holding class consistent preferences, not so much. What about for the not wealthy? Well, very few of them hold conservative economic preferences, but they all vote for the Republicans. A huge percentage of them hold progressive economic preferences, but still 40% of them are voting for the Republicans. So only 22%, so 78% of the deviants diverged despite liberal policy preferences. Only 22% diverged at the policy level uh, first. So we find different paths to deviation. For higher income quartiles, economic ideology explains a fair amount of vote choice. For lower income quartiles, class inconsistent voting behavior is largely not a function of economic belief. They are undertaken notwithstanding the respondent's knowledge that the policies aren't serving him or her or even the nation. So we want to predict two types of deviation now. We set ourselves out to start doing what political scientists love to do, which is to sort of model these choices, right? So we're going to model your choice of economic policy preferences, and we're going to model your choice of partisan uh, candidates in a two-party vote environment. And we're going to test a couple of different alternatives. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you some results from some analysis that we did here. But I'm going to tell you in the new data we collected, we did this in a much more sophisticated fashion. So we have a, um, a multi-category experiment built into the survey where we use a framing mechanism to get people to think in different ways. So we'll be able to show some of, of what that does. But at least for this purposes, with the 2011 data, this is what we have. So we test a couple of different um, potential explanations. One is the social mobility explanation. And this works at both ends of the distribution. And social mobility could be both experiential and aspirational. So if you're wealthy, did you used to be poor? Because we could imagine that if you used to be poor, even though you're now wealthy, you might favor more redistributive policies. You yourself might have been the recipient of redistributive policies and see them as valuable. The second part of that is aspirational. And so we have questions about that in this study and in the new data that we just collected. We asked, do you think you'll be better off in five years or 10 years? Do you think you'll be worse off in five years or 10 years? So you might be wealthy, have always been wealthy, but you think you're on the verge of seeing a rather significant downturn in your circumstances. That might make you also more progressive. Or you could be working class, but aspirational. So um, I am a political scientist, and I was a political science major in college. I'm also a gay man, and I was a vocal performance minor in college. And the only intersection of those two things is the play 1776. And in the play 1776, John Hancock is having an argument with John Dickinson. Because John Hancock favored independence, and John Dickinson did not. And he sings a little song about it, the musical. And in it, 
John Hancock says, fortunately, there are not enough men of property in this country to dictate policy. And John Dickinson's response was, don't forget that most men with nothing would rather protect the possibility of becoming rich than face the reality of being poor. And that is why they will follow us to the right. And so that's his argument, that it's aspirational. Well, we can test that, right? A second sort of big category is racial resentment. Now, um, if there's a few political scientists in the room, you'll know that this measure is hugely contentious. I feel like I want to have David Sears and Paul Snyderman in the room to have like a death match so they can uh, fight over it. Um, but in fact, racial resentment has a lot of face validity, even if there's some internal problems with it. And what it is, it's a four-item index which asks a set of questions, two of which are valence to be pro-minority, and two of which are valence to be critical of minorities. And you invert the scales on half of them, so they're all in the same direction. And you can get a sense of the degree to which people's views on race are driving their policy positions when you enter it um, as a predictor of other things. Now, one of the critiques of it is that the, the scale doesn't hang together very well. That's a problem. It's not clear it generalizes very well behind, beyond African Americans. That's a problem. But nevertheless, it's a good predictor. And it turns out, by the way, since the Trump election, it's like the kick-ass predictor of all econometric models of the 2016 election. Like, if we know what you think about race, we have a very good chance of predicting your vote in the 2016 election. So we look at the role of racial resentment. Is racial resentment causing people to deviate at the second stage? Progressive people who think that their own interests and the country's interests are better served with redistributive policies, but who vote against those candidates anyway. A third version is social gospel, and a third and fourth are kind of paired, is social gospel and religious conservatism. We know that religious conservatism has been a strong force in American politics since about 1980 in the election of Ronald Reagan. Actually, you, if you want to take Douglas Ho Richard Hofstadter's view of it, rather, it goes all the way back into the 19th century. But in fact, religious conservatism has a great deal to do with why people vote the way they do, even if it's in conflict with their economic interests. But one thing we don't talk about a lot in political science, though there's a small literature on it, is a social gospel orientation. That is the notion that there's a set of religious beliefs about the importance of good works, about Christ feeding the poor, that suggest that religious adherents might, in fact, predict left of center views. And we can measure both of those things. We can re measure religious conservatism, and we can measure social gospel adherents to see if they predict the outcomes would expect. So in the first set of analysis, we have this question on ideological deviation. So we want to know how likely it is that for a low-income person or a high-income person, you hold economic policy views different than the ones we would normally expect you to hold. So the red bars are the low-income respondents, and the cream bars are the high-income respondents. So for low-income respondents, the expectation of being poor is less related to deviation. Racial resentment is more related. So working class people who hold racially hostile views are more likely to deviate. Being from the South, a little more. And the level of political interest. So working class people who pay attention are more likely to deviate from favoring uh, progressive economic policy. What about the upper income? Will we ever be rich where they're already doing well? That makes them very less likely to deviate from holding conservative policy positions. Social gospel is a huge explanatory factor. So people whose religious and emotional commitments to senses of fairness and redistribution are very likely at the upper income level to diverge from holding conservative economic policy preferences and political interest. What's interesting is political interest for high income, it's true for both of them, but this means deviation from progressive policies, and this means deviation from conservative policies. So political interest has the same distorting effect among both ends of economic distribution, but in opposite ideological directions. How about vote? So it's a two-stage process. Which economic policies do you choose? How do you then actualize that into vote? Uh, for low-income people, thinking they're going to be rich, that increases 
the likelihood that they vote uh, against, uh, oh, no, excuse me, increases the likelihood that they vote for Obama. That's weird. Racial resentment decreases the likelihood that they vote for Obama. Social gospel up. Self-interested economic and, and so, uh, sociotropic ecological liberalism. So if you believe in progressive policies, it makes you more likely to vote for Obama. If you're religiously conservative or racial re racially resentful, it makes you less likely. What about voting for the Republican nominee? Um, it would be the inverse. Obama vote among the high income. High income people with racial resentment actually are less likely to vote for Obama. Religious conservatives less likely. Political interest less likely. Where liberalism more likely. What's interesting about, and social gospel huge again, what's interesting about this is that the racial resentment effect is bigger among high income people than it is among low income people. Once again, we social scientists like to, to pathologize the working classes, but it turns out that if you, have, if you harbor racial views, they're going to have a much bigger effect on your vote if you're higher income, at least according to this analysis and this data. <clears throat> so I'm going to present some conclusions and then some caveats, and then I'm going to take your questions. So the, the first conclusion is that there's multiple paths to inconsistent preferences and behavior. You can deviate at the policy preference stage, or you can deviate when you operationalize those policy preferences into a vote choice. For the lower income folks, class consistent economic beliefs fail to produce class consistent voting behavior. For upper income folks, class inconsistent behavior is more a function of your economic policy. Small social mobility effects on economic preferences and almost none on behavior. So those aspirational questions or those fears of downward social mobility, they didn't have much in the way of impact. Race is clearly reflected in the economic views of low-income Americans, and it has a huge effect on the political voting behavior of all Americans, in fact, a larger effect on the upper income. Social gospel significantly shapes economic views of upper income citizens and reduces their likelihood of voting for the GOP. Religious conservatism is unrelated to economic policy preferences, but strongly impacts political behavior. So that's where we were when we decided to collect new data, which is the political scientist way of putting off trying to publish something. So again, the new data were collected pre and post the 2018 pre, uh, midterm elections. We have two waves. Um, we have about 2,000 respondents. We were able to engage in a framing experiment. We're able to ask questions about people's self-perception that are more to the point. And if you're interested in hearing how that turns out, come to the International Society of Political Psychology in Lisbon this summer, and I'll tell you how it worked out. But <laughs> just a short flight away. Uh, and that's been in Lisbon is purely coincidental. I've been just as happy to go to Schenectady. Um, but but the, the idea of the project is to start to figure out how these things interact with one another. Our co-author Chris Ojeda and I were having a conversation about this just the other day, and we started to ask the question, like, do you, what sort of attenuation effect do you get from levels of education? Like, is it the case, for example, that education makes you more sophisticated in how you articulate your economic policy preferences, or does it cut against that? Like, you could think of essentially 100 different research questions that flow from this alone. If we ask the question about misperception, who is more likely to misperceive their place in the social hierarchy and with what outcome? Again, we haven't even begun to analyze that. We have 100 different questions we have to do before we start to get to the point where we're able to put, consign this to paper. But you'll get a sense of the type of project that we're working on. That's the broad question. It's hard to present a book in a talk. But give me any questions you want. And if I have any clue at an answer, I'll try my best to answer. We're going to run the mics on the left and the right. 